Hi everyone, it's Ben. I'm back after a short break there through the holidays and into the new year with another resource review for you here on the Data Literacy video channel. This one's called Enumeracy. This is one of the classic works that I really love. It's by John Allen Paulos. He did a great job. This book has been out since 1989, was revised in 2001, and here it is all these decades later, still very applicable. As much as we talk about learning advanced topics like data science, chat GPT, and all the rest, sometimes these basic concepts are the ones that are missing. So I want to give you a few of those anecdotes. First of all, what is enumeracy? Well, the opposite of that would be numeracy. Alberto Cairo, who's on our board, gave us this great quote for our book, 17 Key Traits of Data Literacy. He talks about how working with data you know, requires a certain degree of numerical and graphical literacy, respectively called numeracy and graphicacy. And then he goes on to define numeracy, not just being about math, stats, and logic, but even this sixth sense grounded on a grasp, even a tenuous one of the fundamental concepts of those areas. Um, we can think of then, you know, this overlap of these different abilities and skills, focusing on this blue circle we call numeracy. And Paulos's book covers everything outside of that circle. You know, what are ways in which we struggle with numeracy, given the, the current state of the evolution of our brain? Let me give you three different anecdotes he includes in his book that I find really interesting and helpful. The first is what we call the birthday paradox, in which most people are quite surprised to find out that you only need 23 people in a room in order to have more than 50% chance that at least two of them share the same birthday. That seems like a low number, doesn't it? And where does that math come from? Let's consider an even simpler case of just three people in the room. So with just three people in the room, there are already over 48.6 million possible combinations of birthdays if we allow for duplicates. Of those 48.63 million, 48.23 are unique, where no two people share the same birthday. And that accounts for about 98.18%. So the opposite of that, or you know, the inverse, one minus 98.18% gives us 0.82%, or the probability that at least two people share the same birthday in that group of people, of three people in the room. So that's the math. It's not really that uh, complicated or it's certainly not rocket science. And we can see then if we take the same math and increase it for just 23 people in the room, now is where we get up over 50%. So that surprises most people, but it's true. It's counterintuitive, but uh, the math shows that that is the case. You can see a graph of the increase in probability as the number of people in the room increase as well. Um, another example I love is all about, you know, averages. So he talks about two baseball players from the 20th century, famous Yankees, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. Now, do you think it's possible for there to be a situation in which Babe Ruth has a better batting average than Lou Gehrig in the first half of the season and a better batting average than Lou Gehrig in the second half of the season? But at the end of the season, overall, Lou Gehrig actually ends up having the better batting average. That seems like it's not possible, right? It seems like it makes no sense. How is that possible? So this is one of those cognitive traps. Let's talk about it. So let's say in the first half, Ruth beat Gehrig with a 0 .300 batting average to Lou Gehrig's 0 .290, okay? Then the second half of the season, he beat Gehrig again with a 0 .400 batting average to Lou Gehrig's 0 .390. They both did quite a bit better. How is it then that he has a lower average? It seems like that's the case. So what happened? Well, we can take a look at the number of at-bats. It might not be equal. Maybe in the first half of the season, Babe Ruth came to the plate twice as often as Lou Gehrig. And then the opposite happened in the second half of the season, where both had a higher average, but Lou Gehrig had many, many more at-bats than Babe Ruth in that second half of the season. Meaning that out of their 300 at-bats, a higher percentage of Lou Gehrig's were at that higher batting average level. So that's where we can see that kind of a situation arise. This happens all the time, not just in baseball, but in other types of scenarios as well. Last situation here uh, that I want to talk about, well, actually two more, they involve percent change. This is one that always tricks us too. Let's say you want to go buy a bicycle. All right, well then maybe that bicycle is $100. And then for some reason, you know, they decide to increase the price of the bicycle by 50%. So it goes up to 150%. Now, if you were to decrease that price by 50%, you would think that it would go back to its original price, but it doesn't. It goes lower because the new 50% decrease is being taken on top of that larger number. So half of 150 is 75. And what you'd see then is the bicycle after the second, uh, after the decrease is actually 25% lower overall. 
based on that original price point. So when you increase a percent and then decrease it from that higher base, you end up going lower than where you started, right? That's counterintuitive. You think a 50% increase followed by a 50% decrease gets you back to where you started from, but it doesn't. Another similar example, let's say there's a dress that you wanted to go buy. Again, let's use interest, uh, simple round numbers, $100. Let's say the store re reduced that price by 40%. Okay, well, that takes it down to $60, doesn't it? What would it get if you dropped it by another 40%? You'd think it would be 80% lower than the original price, right? A 40% decrease followed by another 40% decrease. And actually, no, because you only take the 40% off of the new price, which is 60. That drops it to $36. That's a 64% decrease in price overall. Again, you know, another example that really kind of tricks us and doesn't seem to be super obvious. So I really recommend you pick up this book. There's a lot of more examples that I really like that he talks about that still apply today as much as they did back in the 80s when I was a kid. It's a great book. I really recommend you, you uh, read it. And that's the, uh, the end of our resource review today. Feel free to like and subscribe and uh, talk to me in the comments there about what other books you find are helpful to cover this exact same topic and help us all do better speaking the language of data. Okay, thanks everyone. Talk to you soon. Bye now.